Now, let's continue our conversation with regard to leadership skills and requirements. One of the things that Paul was attacked about was that he was inadequate. Inadequate. So, let's make a clear statement about this right up front. All of us are inadequate. I don't believe that I am adequate. I don't believe that I am perfect. I don't believe that I am the best thing or God's best gift to the church. No. Like you, I have my fears. And like you, I recognize my weaknesses. And like you, I recognize my inadequacies. And I recognize that. And I'm okay with that because I don't have to be perfect. Paul was being attacked because he was not perfect. He was inadequate. This was one of the major thrusts. One of the big grenades that they were throwing at him, it was that he was inadequate in everything that he did. And he was criticized because of his physical appearance, because of his speech, okay? and so forth and so forth and so forth. Okay? And so I want you to understand, then the question becomes, who is sufficient for these things? Who is sufficient? That's the question that's going to have to be answered here. So let's begin to do this in, in, in a way that hopefully will make some sense. Because what we had was with these false people that had come with it, who had come into the congregation right, um, from somewhere else and now embedded themselves inside of the congregations in the Corinthian churches, plural, and now they were wreaking havoc with their teachings, and one of the ways was to attack the leadership, and that was the life of Paul, especially in his absence. So if you want to see proof of how important leadership is, don't miss the fact that Satan often aims his most ferocious attacks at key leaders. That's what he does, and he does it well. The concept goes like this. If you kill the pastor, you kill the church. If you injure the pastor, you injure the church. If you maim the pastor, you maim the church. If you cripple the pastor, you cripple the church. That's the kind of mentality that goes on. In 1985, in 1986, there was a war that was raging on three countries simultaneously. In Central America, in the countries of Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Guatemala. Three major wars were taking place simultaneously there. And along the development of those wars, the guerrillas who were fighting, the so-called freedom fighters who were fighting the government soldiers, had made a decision that if you kill the pastors, you can kill the churches. Because the Christian churches were not engaged, neither with the freedom fighters or with the government soldiers. They, the churches can clearly see the abuse and the lies and the treachery that was on both, on both sides. So it became a working principle inside of these civil wars that if you would kill the pastor, you can kill the church. You can set the church a running afoot. They were scattered to the four winds. Well, in 1985-86... And I don't recall exactly the date anymore. Uh, I don't remember. Perhaps my wife does. My wife doesn't forget anything. She, I, I forget everything. She, forget, she doesn't forget anything. But anyway, somewhere in that time period, I went to the country. I was in, I was in the country of El Salvador. And I went to preach in this church. And it's right outside of the capital of the church and it's about 400 people gathered that night into the church. And as they had gathered there, and it was well attended, it was packed. I was at this particular uh, platform, something very similar like this. And it was a big um, wooden, a big wooden um, pulpit there. And <clears throat> I was teaching and preaching the word of God. 
when all of a sudden from the rear of the church, which I can see from my point, of, my point of view, is that you get all of these men come in with hoods over their faces and all of these machine guns, and they begin to just blast away. It came to the point where... <clears throat> And there is now chaos, there's panic in the congregation, there's 400 people trying to run out, and they're running into each other, that it is just pure panic. They had covered the doorways, they had come in firing, and at this point, the, some of the gunmen turned their, their, turned their weapons toward me at the platform, and they began to fire my direction, and I can remember I leaped off the platform. I, re, I remember this, it's, it's, it still plays in my head. And I leaped off the platform, and I wound up on the first pew. Uh, that's how far I jumped, okay? I dove, okay? And as I turned around, I looked back, and I could see the pulpit exploded like Swiss cheese. And the screaming and the gunfire was so loud, and then it stopped. And the gorillas were screaming you know, for everybody to be quiet. He said, I'm going to ask this question, and I'm going to ask it one time. I remember as I slowly got up, and I looked over, and I can, from the first row, and I looked all the way back, and the man who was speaking, whoever the commander was among them, because he had a hood on, and he screamed, and he says, I'm going to ask a question one time, only. How many of you are true genuine Christians. I raised my hand and it was only like eight of us who raised our hands. I was in shock. Only eight of us. And I got a congregation of 400 people in front of me. And he says, take those eight, and remember, it was eight of us, and they, they marched us out the door, and, he, and there was a big trench, a big ditch out in front, probably maybe, um, oh, I would say, maybe about 40, 50 yards from, from the building. There was a big trench, this ditch. And he said, take them out to that ditch and kill them. And they marched us right out there. And we went marching out there. And I remember talking to the man that was in front of me, and there was a lady behind me. He says, we're going to die. And I says, yes, but we die in Christ. And they didn't ask us to jump down the ditch. They kicked us down into the ditch. We, we, they threw us down. It took a few moments to get, collect, get, get ourselves collected. And, and I told him, I said, well, let's pray. And we prayed. And I committed myself and these, and these seven other people into the hands of Christ because now we could look up and there were the gunmen getting ready to shoot at us. And we prayed and put our hands in Christ. And we looked back because we could stand up and you could see, it was barely, we could barely see just over the, um, the, the height of the ditch. And we could see they closed up the church building. They closed the church building up with everybody in it. And then they set the whole building on fire. And we saw 400 people die in that flames. And the commander said, they die for being cowards. They say they're Christians and they weren't Christians. He says, you die for being Christians. Now, why do I share that with you? Because I want you to understand something here. This principle by which the enemy works is that if you can destroy the pastor, you can destroy the church. And just as the, just as the, uh, the guerrillas were about to shoot at us, 
all of a sudden, they turned around and they began to fire in another direction. And, he, and what we did not know was that the Salvadoran army was approaching. And a gun battle took place between them. And while that gun battle took place between them, we crawled right out of that ditch and never looked back. And the reason I take time to share that with you because I want you to understand something. We're not superheroes. We were saved by the grace of God. But it's when I could see for the next number of years how going into the country of Nicaragua, going into the country of El Salvador, going into the country of Guatemala, and we could see that it was, it was a common practice that if you kill the pastor, you kill the church. That mentality, that strategy was what is, what is and was at work at that time and continues to this day around the world. So if you want to see proof about how important leadership is, don't miss the fact that Satan often aims his most ferocious attacks at key leaders. Among all the wicked devices the evil one employs, some of his favorite weapons are half-truths and deliberate lies that breed rebellion and, 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 and attempt to undermine the trust that people have placed in godly leaders. We saw this throughout the wars there in, in Central America that the guerrillas would pass these pamphlets out okay, and make sure that the churches received them talking about the pastor and how the pastor was unreliable. Against the very best of leaders, Satan will invariably try to stir up a Kora, K-O-R-A-H, Korah, the rebel who organized a revolt against Moses or an Absalom, Okay? The wayward son who led a rebellion against David's rule. That's why scripture says this. Rebellion is a sin of witchcraft. Look at this. In 1, Corinthians, I mean, 1 Samuel chapter 15. In 1 Samuel 15, 23. Look at this. For rebellion is as the sin of divination. And insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord... He has also rejected you from being king. See, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, as divination. To defy a leader who is called by God and faithful to the truth is peculiarly satanic. It is a peculiarly satanic sin. I want you to understand that. It's evil. So therefore, it is appropriate that Paul said that the false teachers who had confused the church in Corinth were satanic emissaries. They were ministers of Satan. This is what he called them. Look at this. Now, turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Because I want you to see this. And in fact, um, look at it very clear, carefully with me. Because... Paul's words were very precise. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. Now, I'm reading out of the uh, New American Standard Version of the Bible. You might be reading out of King James or New King James or the NIV or some other version of the Bible. And in a number of those versions, he uses the word, they are transforming himself or transforming themselves. Uh, it's one of the words that's used there. Now, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves or transforming themselves as apostles of Christ. So I want you to mark the word disguising or transforming, whatever the word is in your version there. And then look at verse 14. No wonder for even Satan disguises himself or transforms himself. Mark the word there, disguises himself as an angel of light. And then look at verse 15. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also, what? Disguise themselves or transform themselves and mark the word there. So you see it three times in verse 13, verse 14, verse 15. Uh, them, uh, disguising themselves as servants of righteousness whose end will be according to their deeds. Now, 
And, and, and I'm recalling what this word means here. Um, when you see that word disguising or disguises or disguise, it doesn't matter, transforming, transformed, or been transformed, okay? Um, that the word, the Greek word that's used there is a very specific word there, okay? And it's the word metaschematizo, metaschematizo. And, and it's a Greek word, metaschematizo, okay? It's M-E-T-A-S-C-H. Uh, e M A T Z O, and that word metasgamatizo, okay, and, and it comes from two different words, okay. Meta is one, okay. Uh, schema is another word, and you put them together, okay. And and what it means, this word, it means to transfigure, okay, or it means to disguise, okay. And I I want you to know to transform. Now, and and. The way the word is used, okay, um, typically, this is how, in the New Testament, the way this specific word is used here, it means that they were masquerading, masquerading as apostles of Christ. How? By putting on an outward um, um, habiliments or clothing, okay, um, posing as ministers of Christ, or what's called as the gentlemen of the cloth, okay, and the word is always used in terms of deceit. So they were masquerading. They were pretending to be something. And Paul is identifying these people in the congregation. Listen to me carefully. That's the reason why. Listen to me very carefully, Pastor. You need to protect your pulpit very at all costs. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? We are too lax with the pulpit. We allow every Tom, Dick, and Harry to come in and preach some nonsense message and confuse your people. There are way too many people who disguise themselves as something that they are not. And I have a lot of experience in this area. For all of us here in the United States of America, where we're housed, we have all these preachers that come from all over the world. And here in Los Angeles, California, where I am, they come in every week off of the air, right off the airport. We're not that far from the airport. We're only about four miles from the airport, not even that. And people, they just pour in, and they always call me on the telephone from the airport. God gave me a word for your congregation. When can I come? Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Time out. Who are you? We get that weekly here. And then for all of you in, in, uh, around the world, whether you're in the Philippines or you're in Asia, uh, all of you in Latin America, all of you in Africa and in Europe, and you got all these American preachers going over into your churches and you just open the door just because he happens to be an American. Stop that. You need to sift out, weigh out, who are these people? And the only reason why you open the door to them is because they usually come with money. You should be ashamed of that. Many of these people, they're not there for good reasons. They've come disguising themselves. That is exactly what they were. They were tools of the devil evil agents in his campaign against the cause of truth. These people are looking to buy you so they can claim they have a ministry that they have not earned, they purchased. They had deliberately focused their main offensive against Paul and his leadership. It was a, it was a strategic, well-placed assault because it, if the powers of darkness could nullify Paul's influence in Corinth, that already troubled church would be completely at the mercy of all of the false apostles and they, it would have fallen just hook, line, and sinker right into their hands. Paul was not eager to defend himself personally, but neither was he willing to abandon the Corinthian church to the wolves. So he had to make a decision here. 
So he spent a considerable amount of time in 2 Corinthians doing something he found dis completely distasteful, defending his own character and credentials. Now he had to do this, not because he was looking for his good name, but because what motivated that was that he had to protect the church that was under attack. Paul's competency as a leader and an apostle was under direct attack by all of these false teachers. <clears throat> and we've already seen how this, how his sincerity was being questioned. Remember that? The false teachers were also trying to provoke doubts about his adequacy to lead. <clears throat> they attacked his character. They attacked his influence. They attacked his calling. And they attacked his humility. See those four things? <clears throat> when the enemy really wants to try to get, get at you, well, here's, here's how the, this is usually the pattern that it works out. Listen to me carefully, Pastor. Somebody will attack your character. Okay. They're going to attack your influence. They're going to attack your calling. And then they're going to attack your humility. And it's a very well-placed strategic plan. And it works. That's usually the order that they do it in. Okay? It's usually the order in which Satan does it in. Okay? And so you need to be very, very careful with this. Mm -hmm. Paul, see, you don't have to understand that Paul understood that. See, in other words, what they were saying that they claimed that Paul was not qualified to lead. That was their claim. He was not qualified to lead. He was inadequately, and this is what they said about him, okay? And they, and they repeated this charge over and over and over again. That's the reason why we started out and we said this at this session. We said, who is sufficient for this? Who is adequate for this? Well, let's be very honest. Not one of us is qualified. <clears throat> let's be very clear about that. If we, can, if we can get that as an understanding. It's God who qualifies us. We don't come qualified. He qualifies us when he calls us. Why? Because he calls us based on character, based on his call upon our lives, our influence, and our humility. That's what he's, he's going to use those four avenues, if I can say that, to build up our qualifications. But you don't come pre-qualified, right? He is the one who qualifies. <clears throat>